Welcome to the American, Acad American Academy of X-Rays webinar, Call for Volunteers Information Session. Thank you all so much for joining us today. I am Tony Washington, the Manager of Membership and Volunteer Engagement. I'll be your moderator today as well as one of your presenters. Before we get started, I'd like to point out a few tools on your screen that can help maximize your viewing experience. The individual windows are resizable and movable, so please feel free to move them around and get the most use out of your desktop space. You may expand the slide area and the media player by clicking on the arrows in the top right corners of the windows. If you have questions for our presenters, please enter them in the ask a question box. And if you have a question right now, we actually encourage you to put the question there now so you don't forget it. And so we have plenty of time to ask the questions, answer the questions at the end of our presentation. The slides from today's webinar are available in the slides and resources section. For some answers to some common technical questions, please click the help button at the top at the bottom of your screen. We invite you to share your feedback on today's webinar by clicking the Take Survey tool on your screen. Webinars like today's are part of the Academy's service mission to the public in the U.S. actuary profession. The Academy informs the public of the role and value of actual actuarial work, delivers value of members to members, assists policymakers in the formation of sound public policy, and sets professional standards for U.S. actuaries. A little bit more information before we get started. This program today, including remarks made by attendees, will be recorded and published. If you have any questions, once again, we encourage you to use the Ask Question window on your screen. So today's presenters joining me today is our Executive Director of the American Academy of Actuaries, Bill Michelin. One of our volunteers, Lauren Cavanaugh, who's the Chairperson of our Volunteer Engagement Subcommittee, and of course, myself. Our agenda looks something like this. We're gonna start off with why volunteering matters, talk a little bit more about the Academy, the benefits of volunteering with the Academy, uh, volunteer, Academy volunteers, how to raise your get involved, the call for volunteers process, and then we'll end it with a Q&A session. So next up is our executive director, Bill Mission. Thank you, Tony, and welcome everyone. I believe and like to say that volunteers like yourselves, as well as prospective volunteers, are the lifeblood of the Academy. And with your support, we make possible the development and delivery of over 300 publications and resources each and every year. We share those with members and external stakeholders at the state, federal, and global level. As, and I like to think that volunteering is not just about the benefits for the Academy, it's also about you and the actuarial profession. In fact, I believe an investment in the academy and the profession is an investment in you and the professional community that you're all part of. And volunteering really is an excellent opportunity that benefits you across multiple levels. You grow professionally and personally. I know when my, per my employer supported me to volunteer in various organizations, it helped me grow leadership skills that I may not have had on certain projects working with clients, whether that be speaking publicly working with teams, leading volunteer teams. It truly does help you as a professional. And I believe when you have that assistance and opportunity to, to stretch those skills and develop those skills, that value is something that you bring back to your employers as well as your clients and principals that you serve. And holistically, all of that really does provide you that opportunity that we all really are interested in and in giving back to the professional community that we're in as well as the U.S. actual profession. So again, volunteering really does provide a multifaceted opportunity to each and every one of us. I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't say that volunteering also truly helps the Academy fulfill its mission. Without our volunteers, that would not be possible. When you look at the ecosystem that supports the development of all those publications and resources I mentioned, really it comes down to over a thousand volunteers working together across multiple practice areas, committees and subcommittees and task forces. All of those working efforts are supported by 45 Academy staff that work across multiple departments, as well as three senior actuarial fellows that work across retirement, casualty and health all working together to ensure that the Academy's messaging around public policy and professionalism 
is heard and leveraged by our members, but also by many, many external stakeholders and decision makers that rely on our independent and objective perspective, analysis, and research to inform public policy as well as to participate in many different conversations around professionals and topics. So again, volunteers are critical to executing the mission of the Academy to Serve. So let's spend a few minutes talking a little bit about the Academy for those that uh, may not may just need a little bit of refresher. So the Academy is uh, was established almost 60 years ago. Just a slight little plug, next year we'll be celebrating that 60 year anniversary. Uh, and the Academy was founded to be the voice on professionalism and public policy in the United States. And the Academy was also established to provide that needed structure to house the professionalism elements for actuaries that we'll speak to a little bit later, specifically the Actuarial Standards Board or the AFB, as well as the Actuarial Board for Counseling and Discipline or the ABCB. Our mission is to serve the public and the US actuarial profession. And we are very proud to fulfill that mission on behalf of our over 20,000 members, as well as the many stakeholders that we engage with and work with to promote the value of the actual profession in the United States. So let's break down the mission, but more specifically, how do we fulfill that mission? And there's really three primary areas that we focus on. Professionalism, where we maintain the standards of qualifications, the standards of practice, the code of conduct, and the counseling and discipline process, and where we provide education and resources on various professionalism topics such as the bias requirement within the USQS that was brought forward at the end of 2021. So those and many other topics are covered within our great professionals and webinars that are very popular amongst members and non-members. Second to that is public policy, where we work across our committees and subcommittees to provide independent objective analysis, research and perspectives on key issues and topics impacting the profession, but also decision makers at the federal, state and global level. Topics like climate change, cyber risk, health equity. These are many topics that are covered across our various public policy uh, aspects. In addition, we also offer provi and provide educational resources and forms for discussion on many of these topics, working with our members, our stakeholders, and other organizations that touch some of these topics. Lastly, our membership. And membership is where we serve over 20,000 actuaries with educational resources and thought-provoking publications, like Contingencies Magazine. If you haven't seen the current issue, be sure to grab it. Um, and we work with our stakeholders to ensure that they understand and have a broader awareness for the importance of the actual profession in the United States, the resources available to those members, as well as understanding what it means to be an actuary. And when you talk about professionalism, I wanted to focus on how we fulfill the mission to serve and advance the profession through our professionalism as, uh, elements. Elements of professionalism and really the mark of a recognized profession include the following, a code of conduct, qualification standards, or in our case, the USQS, standards of practice, otherwise known as ASOPs, and a disciplinary process that is available to members uh, to ensure when an issue occurs that they have the support and the counseling and Unfortunately, in some cases, the discipline process to ensure that they, they're doing the right thing. Together, these elements, coupled with continuing education and the professional judgment of actuaries, really contributes to the public's trust in what we do as actuaries and the ability to maintain and protect our status as a self-regulated profession. Here on the screen, you see a, a general depiction of the structure of the academy with various elements. I'll touch upon several of them, but really what this is meant to reinforce is how each and every one of these elements works together across the organization and is critical to maintaining a strong and effective organization to support the actual profession in the United States. So over on the top, you see more of a governance and oversight standpoint where you see the academy board, the executive committee, governance structures that are put into place, senior staff policies and guidelines that really help govern how the organization operates. One of those key pillars of strategic importance is professionals and education, uh, where you see elements of professionals like I talked to, the code, the USQS, our ASOPs, and the counseling process. One key differentiator 
for those that may not be privy to the structure, is that the ASB and the ABCD are separate independent boards that are housed within the academy structure and supported by academy staff, but are independent decision-making bodies. Uh, and that is an important key aspect to the academy structure. The second pillar there, membership, we have the committee on membership that are supported by staff. And within the committee, you also have a focus on member requirements. You also have a focus, a renewed focus on volunteer engagement and satisfaction and more how we serve and engage with many, many segments of our membership population. And lastly, that third pillar is public policy, uh, where you see our practice councils and committees, our staff uh, liaisons and analysts, as well as our senior actuarial fellows. Supporting all of this, providing foundational support, much needed foundational support are our many shared service areas like finance, HR, and IT, our education and events team that puts on those great events that hopefully you'll be able to participate in in person or our virtual webinars like this one today, as well as our marketing communication uh, team that ensures proper awareness and communication of everything going on at the academy. I wanted to go a little bit deeper though on the various volunteer elements, many of which will show up in the call for volunteers survey that you'll see later this week. Um, and not listed here are the boards. I mentioned the ASB and the Actuarial Board of Counseling and, and Discipline, the ABCD. And I also mentioned the Academy Board, that is a 21 person board. And you can definitely learn more about those as you uh, look to volunteer. So there's four primary structures within our committee structure. Uh, councils are ones that provide the leadership by practice area. They are chaired by a vice president who sits on the Academy Board and typically consists of various committee chairs. They really are ones that aggregate and look more holistically across a practice area, whether that be health, life, casualty, or professionals in education as a, as a council. Uh, and they really work across the committees to ensure that the work that's being done is relevant to our members, but also relevant to the stakeholders that we serve. Committees fit within that council structure and they have a chair, but they have a distinct focus on a priority area. Think health equity, social security, capital adequacy, climate change, data science and analytics. These are just some of the many committees that are housed within our various councils. Subcommittees work within the committee structure to pursue a specific issue, a work product or, or a topic. Some subcommittees that exist today include the new AI subcommittee that sits within our data science and analytics committee. If you have an interest, definitely raise your hand for that one, it's a new one. Task forces have a clearly defined objective related to a specific project that has a defined time frame and can be aligned at any level supporting a council, a committee, or a subcommittee. There are various task forces that sit at every level. One example is the board, the Academy Board actually had a task force looking at DE&I several years ago. That task force then became a committee, which now resides under the board's guidance as the DE&I committee. So again, many different structures within our committee and and council structure. Uh, good to know as a volunteer, you'll have plenty more opportunities to learn more about these, but I want to just give you a high level overview. So at this point, I'm gonna hand it over to Lauren, who's gonna talk about benefits of volunteering. Thank you, Bill. Uh, so I, I am very, uh, very much looking forward to talking to you all about the benefits of volunteering. I have been a volunteer for over 10 years now and have just found it so beneficial um, from my career and uh, to, to network with others and so on. And so I'll talk about some of the examples as we go through these slides. Uh, so, so first and foremost, I think this is what most people think of when they think of, you know, why they want to volunteer is just being some, a part of something that is bigger than what you might be doing in your, uh, in your job at your employer to make a larger impact onto the actuarial profession. It gives a, you know, a strong sense of pride and, and ownership of our, of our actuarial profession to be able to do these types of uh, committee, this type of committee work. Um, contributing to the actuarial profession at large and supporting the academy mission is, is just something that, yeah, I think a lot of volunteers, when I speak to many people, just find um, so gratifying in and of itself but I'm gonna get into some other benefits as well. Um, so, but as, as we think about this, I, I think of, you know, going back to um, 2020 when I was transitioning into the role of chairing the Casualty Practice Council, 
uh, in collaboration with others, we, we saw a need for a new committee on equity and fairness related to property casualty insurance topics. Um, and other councils found similar needs in, um, in their councils as well. And and through that, we, we developed a new committee. Um, I led that for a number of years and, uh, and it really kind of hit on exactly what was needed at the time as regulators and lawmakers were looking at these equity and fairness issues. Uh, this created a way for the academy to have really a front seat in discussing these things with uh, with decision makers. And those decision makers have given us so much feedback on the um, just the importance of having that actuarial lens, that actuarial perspective um, in on those conversations. It, give, it gave me and others that were interested in that particular committee um, opportunities to, to interact with those decision makers in a way that they might not always have. And so that, that was gratifying as well. Also, you know, so much benefit related to career advancement and professional recognition. Um, I, I think that especially um, when you're faced with um, wanting to have new opportunities in your actuarial profession that's not available at your company, volunteering is just such a great way to be able to uh, I, I, I can't really think of any skill that, that you might want to hone in on that you can't get through, you know, some sort of academy involvement. And I think, you know, listed here are some soft skills, too, if you're looking into wanting more uh, leadership. My experience has been, you know, the most important thing about having a committee chair or sub chair or vice chair or something like that is just a desire to do so and a, and a commitment to to the work that we're doing. So it really opens the door for a lot of leadership opportunities that um, that actuaries might not have otherwise in the work that they do. Um, I really uh, I really saw the benefits of this um, when I rolled on to the the board. I guess that was in uh, 2018. And just being able to have more of that uh, executive leadership training through that work was uh, something that I didn't have at my at my work, and I really found it very uh, uh, very enlightening and and fun to do in collaboration with the with the other board members. And there's just so many opportunities like that in the volunteering opportunities that you'll see in the survey. And of course, networking. So this is a really great way. Volunteering is a great way to just meet actuaries um, that you might not otherwise meet, you know, outside of your firm, right? And to I, I can say for myself, I've I've built really la long lasting friendships. I'll have them for the rest of my life um, through some of the work that I've done at the academy. Um, this picture here is taken at one of the academy meetings a number of years ago, and I believe all of the people in this picture um, were a rising actuary award winner. And there they are, you know, the the next generation of our of our leaders in the actuarial um, profession, networking with each other and getting to know each other um, at that meeting. And there's a lot of different ways, um, you know, sometimes in person, but then also, um, you know, collaborating virtually. Um, you know, you can really develop uh, mentors, friendships, and, and things like that uh, based on uh, based on the committee work that you might do. So just a huge benefit, and I and I can say I didn't necessarily get into volunteering for this, um, but it, it has is definitely been so valuable to just hear, you know, from different perspectives and be able to, you know, call someone up um, outside of your firm if, if you're um, if you have a question or or something comes up, it's it's come up many times for, for me. So a huge benefit here on networking. It also helps you to just be a more informed actuary. So we obviously have our continuing education that we all need to adhere to. But I find that when you um, you get your continuing ed by these. Uh, uh, collaborative environments with committee work. It's just so much more deep and rich that education that you get. Uh, I've also, you know, many volunteers will 
be interested in a particular area. You might be interested in climate change or um, or uh, equity and diversity, for example. And this is something that you might not have in your uh, in your work but you want to learn more about what we can do as an actuarial profession. Being involved in the committee can help you to learn. You could be, you know, at first a, a silent listener as, as people are, are discussing different issues. And then as you learn more, get more and more involved. Um, actually, when I first started volunteering, it was because someone had asked me to be part of the uh, Property Casualty Risk-Based Capital Committee. And I said to the person, well, I don't really know much about risk-based capital except what I learned on the exams. And, and he said, oh, don't worry about that. You'll, you'll learn as you go. And, and I definitely learned a ton doing that. That's stuff that I, I still use to this day in, in the work that I do. So, so a huge benefit there as well. And uh, employers of, of Academy volunteers really get a lot of benefits too. Um, Number one, it just you know stands to reason all of the different benefits that I just laid out for the individual is really, really beneficial to the employer as well. Because those volunteers and the people that I've met, I can say for sure, are you know incredibly engaged, knowledgeable actuaries that um, that learn some of the softer skills and and uh, and really uh, have such a uh, more of an ownership, right, in our profession. And I think that that is really important to the companies that they serve as well. So, you know, a lot, there's a lot listed on this slide. And I would just say if you're, if you're, um, you know, needing to provide the business case to your employer for, for why you would like to volunteer, this slide is, is a helpful tool to, to, to reference and to look at um, when providing that uh, business case. I also want to just give everyone a flavor for who the volunteers are at the Academy. So this first slide actually is the demographics about all of the members of the Academy. So we're now at 20,400 members and the, the little breakouts below show the demographics by age, by gender split now, but like 70, 30 male, female, and then of course a sliver um, non-binary and then race, race and ethnicity and practice area. And I won't spend too much time on this slide, but just to say this provides a, a baseline to kind of compare that to who, who of our membership are volunteering. Okay, so if we look at gender, um, that's over on the left. The blue bars show the membership and the orange bars show the volunteer percentage. So there's actually a little bit more of an equalization between male and female when you look at volunteerism um, um, with a roughly you know, 65, 35 split between um, males and females on, on volunteers. So more, more women as a percentage um, volunteer as a percentage of membership. And then over on the right, um, it shows by area of practice. So, you know, I think both of these charts show, you know, really strong uh, representation uh, sliced by this way. Um, when you look at the areas of practice, you can see that, that volunteers are not dominated by any one particular area of practice, but it really cuts fairly evenly. This slide might suggest that we need a little bit more help actuaries to be uh to be volunteering but other than that yeah you know you see just some strong uh volunteer efforts across the board all right so this slide here looks by age and this one looks a little different so you don't see so much evenness in the bars and i think that that um it in some regards makes sense right as as you're in the uh, in the profession longer, and as you're a more tenured uh, member of the academy, you might have more and more opportunities to volunteer. Uh, and so, uh, and, and and certainly for those that are under 30, they still might be taking exams and be very busy with those types of activities. But even you see in 30 to 39 age band, you know there is a bit of a of a difference there between the membership at 27.3% versus 
to the the ones that are actually engaged in volunteering. Um, so I think there's a little bit of a opportunity there. But even that being said, you can see that you know you have if you're if you enter into any given committee, you're going to see a lot more diversity than maybe you maybe you think um, uh, based on by, by age and, and by all of the ones that we just talked about. Similarly, on race and ethnicity, this is, you know, very, the blue and orange bars are very even. In other words, you know, we do get a lot of diversity drawing from the membership pool that we have, you know, in the, in the, um, in the diversity that's in the membership pool. But there's no clear, you know, um, obvious trend here of um, lopsided um, volunteerism compared to membership. And then um, this is showing the uh, the differences in volunteerism by employment type. So consulting is is showing that it's forty percent of all volunteers are consultants. About forty percent are in, in, from insurance companies, and then seven percent from government entities. Um, that would be state government and also federal um, government and so on, you know, strong uh, showing from retired folks as well. So, um, so yeah, again, we see, you know, a, a diverse range of perspectives. That's definitely been my um, experience working in committees and councils and boards and everything is that there is a really good diversity by practice area, by, um, by employment type, by race age and all these things, which really brings uh, a rich, uh, a richer discussion when we have, you know, wh whatever the topic might be, it's really um, made richer because of the diversity in the committees that we have. Uh, but definitely opportunity here, I would say, in maybe elevating the representation from uh, insurance companies. Um, and I think that's it on what we have regarding who comprises our volunteers. And with that, I will pass it over to Tony. Thank you, Lauren. So now we're on to the part where you can raise your hand and get involved. Um, we have a lot to cover. I'm going to try to be, give you a high level view of some areas and try to leave enough time so we can have a uh, question and answers as well. So you heard about the benefits. Um, I definitely want to show you how easy it is for you to get involved in the Academy. I think that's one thing that we do. Uh, we make it easy for you to raise your hand and get involved. Just a general note as we get going here, um, the call for volunteers will be open through September the 6th. Uh, that's one of the ways where, of course, we recruit volunteers as we move forward. Uh, we plan to do more of these sessions. Um, in addition, as we continue to grow um, as an organization on the volunteer engagement side, uh, we have something called higher learning, um, excuse me, higher learning, higher logic that's going to be uh, play a big part in our volunteer uh, program and volunteer management. And also, if you're also interested outside of the call for volunteers and expressing your interest to volunteer, um, of course, we hope that you take this survey, but even afterwards, you can always go online and complete the volunteer form. Okay, so before you take the call for volunteer survey, some of the first steps we de definitely recommend you to take are to review the call for volunteers information page. What you see on the screen is an example of the information page. Um, this page is going to go live uh, today at 2 o'clock, and you see the, the website there, actuary.org forward slash volunteer 2024. The reason that it's good to go look through things first, because you want to be able to look through the questions and prepare your responses to some of the key questions that are on the survey, and that will save you a lot of time. In addition, that will help us when you raise your hand and complete your survey, to be able to better match you with uh, the committees that you've selected on the survey. On that information page, um, you're gonna see a list of all the committees that appear on the survey, and you're gonna see some crit critical information about the committees as well. Each committee on the list is set up the same way. So when you click on, you see like the blue bar there, you'll click on the blue bar, you'll see a drop down. it'll tell you more about a brief description about the committee, also tell you about the time commitment involved, uh, any travel requirements, as well as any skills or experience that the group is looking for uh, when it comes to you raising your hand or joining the committee. You also notice the well, committees that are listed that say, you know, some of the committees listed are actively seeking volunteers. You'll see a lot of them, of course, that are actively seeking volunteers, meaning 
they are in need of volunteers right now. Then you're gonna see some committees listed on the survey that don't say actively seeking. It doesn't mean that they're not looking for volunteers, it's just that they do not have as much space for volunteers. So we always encourage you to find those groups that are actively seeking volunteers. But of course, still, if there's a group that catches your eye and you're interested, you know, please express your interest um, and if space becomes available, um, then an opportunity will become available to serve uh, along with that committee. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna highlight some of the uh, committees and some of the task forces that uh, our various uh, committee liaisons and chairpersons asked me to highlight on this call for volunteers. I'm gonna not go into the weeds of things because I think you know this is probably clearly laid out on the website with more detail. So I'm gonna keep it pretty high level. So you all know these are the committees, some of the committees that they've asked us to highlight because they're actively seeking volunteers and you'll also see some new committees highlighted. So first you'll see ASB. We're highlighting the general committee. Uh, the general committee is comprised of actuaries from all practices. So whether your health, whether your retirement, or pension, um, whether your casualty, uh, it's made up of all actuaries and all practices. For casualty practice council, we're highlighting two new uh, committees here, or excuse me, task forces. The homeowners insurance task force, which is new, and the commercial liability insurance task force, both of actively seeking volunteers. For our council on, Prof council on professionalism and education, we have a committee on professional responsibility. Um, this committee seeks to promote knowledge and standards of conduct, qualification and practice, and the committee does so in coordination with responsible academy bodies. Next up is our Health Practice Council. Me being new here at the, at the American Academy of Actuaries, I was so surprised at how many committees the Health Practice Council um, had. So it's a large number of committees, so we can always use plenty of volunteers. It covers a large range of topics as well. Um, you'll see two committees that we're highlighting here, the Behavioral Health Task Force Committee and the Healthcare Delivery Committee. The Retirement Practice Council, which is formerly known as our Pension Practice Council, um, is highlighting the Social Security Committee, which I've been told is one of our longest standing committees uh, and probably one of our most important committees here at the American Academy of Actuaries. The Presidential Committee, the Research Committee, one thing to remember, I always try to remind people about the Research Committee. Um, the Research Committee, those who raise their hand and express their interest, uh, the vice presidents make the selections for the research committee. So, and I'll talk a little bit more about raising your hand and committees and how the chairpersons um, lead that selection process a little later, but that's something to keep in mind um, when you raise your hand to show your interest in the research committee, there's another step there um, with that committee. And Bill mentioned this earlier, um, for our risk management and financial reporting council, we have our AI subcommittee, which is new and that is uh, actively seeking volunteers, as well as our reinsurance work group too. Life Practice Council, another council that has plenty of committees for you to get involved with. Uh, we're highlighting our Life Evaluation Committee here. Um, they proactively seek to provide actuarial support, advice, and communication on life insurance topics that involve the evaluation of life insurance and annuity products. And then you'll see our Life Underwriting and Risk Classification Committee as the second committee that's being highlighted on our life practice councils. Next up, we're gonna talk a little bit more about other volunteer opportunities. So maybe you're starting off, you know, this is your first time volunteering. Uh, maybe you're very busy, but you wanna get involved, but you don't know how you're gonna fit in yet with your schedule. So the one thing that the Academy has is micro volunteering opportunities. And for those of you all not familiar with micro volunteering opportunities, these are short term opportunities, often limited in scope. Um, such as writing an article or speaking or peer review. One area in which we um, have a new opportunity this year is our general education volunteer pool. So the general education volunteer pool is for those of you who want to help with maybe reviewing a program proposals, uh, virtual event development and speaker recruitment, maybe content tagging and a course in curriculum development with our Academy Learning. So that's, that's our newest um, micro volunteering opportunity. Uh, the pension assistant list is also uh, an opportunity that we're always looking for volunteers for those who raise their hand. Um, and it's very important because it's a, 
It's open to all actuaries who are interested in helping individuals who seek to understand their pension benefits. So PAL has been around for quite some time. Um, it's also intended for professional services consumers who have questions about their pension plans. So we're regularly looking for individuals to volunteer for that. So once again, if you're not sure how your schedule works or you're kind of nervous about getting involved, a micro volunteering opportunity, a limited scope volunteer opportunity uh, may be the perfect opportunity for you to get your start volunteering with the Academy. And I forgot to mention one more, the volunteer mentor pool, which was started last year. Uh, this is a great pool for somebody who wants to serve as a mentor. Uh, one area where we're trying to increase our volunteerism is with our early uh, career actuaries. Um, so it'll be a wonderful thing if you know if that's your thing, mentoring, um, helping guide somebody along, be that support for them. Uh, this is a nice opportunity for you to get involved with the Academy. Okay, so the process. So once you've taken the time to review the list of committees on the website and determine the list of opportunities that interest you, it's time to take the survey itself. And remember one thing that I mentioned previously, it's good to sit, go to the page on the website, uh, academy.org forward slash volunteer 2024, which will be live this afternoon and read through the survey um, and especially go over you know, the areas in which you feel like you have your, you know, your strengths. Um, and then also areas that you look for an opportunity where you would be want to grow, because Lauren touched on that as well, and areas in which she wanted to grow a little bit more professionally. So types of questions on the call for volunteer survey. Uh, of course, we're gonna ask for your name and contact information. Um, the types of questions and information that you expect here are you know, your typical, you know, also demographic information, but something that's really important I'm gonna to touch on soon is that COI, COI and CE, which Bill touched on, and coming back once again to skills and experience. Um, when you're going through that section, um, please, particularly related to your volunteering opportunities, express that, you know, talk about the skills and experience experiences that relate to the committees uh, that you're interested in. So open-ended questions for the call for volunteers. So we want you to list any special experience, skills, interests. Uh, that's very important. And as I'm talking right now, if you do have questions, please put them in the ask the question box so we can get to them at the end for you. Uh, in addition, this the skills and experience that you list and the volunteer positions that you may have done in the past or any articles that you've written or research papers, work-related experience, or a passion that you have addressed to an issue, please share that with us. Um, that's something good for our chairs to understand um, so they can, you know, better place people on committees. You also want to share any related public policy or professional uh, experience, uh, attending conferences or meetings like NACA or any other actuarial or insurance-related events, or any professional leadership training that you may have, or any training experiences that you may have as well. So please share that with us. That really helps us be able to, you know, match you up with the committees um, that you're interested in. In addition to these open-ended questions, um, when we go to identify volunteers, I think I've covered this a couple of times, uh, the chairs uh, will work along with the committee liaisons uh, and the membership team. We all kind of work together uh, to support the volunteer volunteer program here at the Academy. So how did you hear about this year's call for volunteers? We definitely want to hear about that. It's always good for us to find out, you know, how you're getting, getting that information or how that information is getting to you. Um, please definitely share any additional comments or concerns or other information while completing the survey. And please share information that might be, of course, helpful uh, to us recruiting other volunteers. Um, we're always looking for new volunteers and new individuals to join the Academy, to strengthen uh, the Academy and its various committees. So we touched on this a little bit earlier. So annually Academy, we have all volunteers each year submit their COI and CE acknowledgements. So many of you, of course, have, will not have submitted this information yet because uh, you're not a volunteer. For those of you who are you know, coming back to us, you may have heard this uh, previously. Uh, but every year we have you do this. So uh, as you may join the committee, uh, if you did not complete that area of the survey uh, before you begin your volunteer engagement to be placed on a committee um, or your acceptance of the committee, uh, we will have you sign your um, COI and CE. The conflict interest policy is really important because the fundamental purposes of the Academy is to require us to maintain a high level of professional objectivity as well as independence, like Bill talked about previously. 
uh, from any specific interest or employers or its members or interested parties serving on the committees. When it comes to the education perspective, you know, it's expected that each actuary have completed 30 hours of CE, including six from organized activities, three from professional topics, and one from biased topics, um, as written in the U.S. qualification standards. And once again, we come back to, you know, then compliance is as of January 1st of each year. So once you complete your first year of volunteerism, we will come back to you to remind you, hey, it's January 1st, 2025, you know, please complete um, your acknowledgement of your conflict of interest and your continuing education. If you ever have any specific questions about these policies, you always can reach out to our Academy General Counsel, uh, Brian Jackson. So next steps. For all committee placements, like I mentioned previously, our chairs are responsible for addressing the results, working with the staff liaisons, they'll review the responses of the survey, to determine whether to add new members or gather more information on respondents' qualifications. They'll provide feedback to the membership department, um, who was added and who was not added and why. In addition, if and when you are contacted by a committee placement, we encourage you to ask further questions about the committee. Um, you know, specific time commitment, um, details that you may have not saw in the, you know, the committee descriptions. Um, and also just, you wanna ask those questions to make sure it's a good fit for you. You know, the more questions you ask, you know, no questions are dumb questions. So feel free to ask those questions. Um, our committee liaisons and our chairs are um, very helpful. And also, um, please allow time to hear back from the committee placements um, after you take the survey. Some committees may not determine until the end of the year because of their different planning schedules. Um, however, if you're anxious and you kind of know what to update and what's going on, feel free to reach out with any specific questions about the status of your volunteer requests. And also one thing to remember, um, while you may have chosen to serve on one or more committees, placements once again are based on the needs of the committees first in determining whether or not you'll be placed on the committees of your choice. Also, when you submit your survey, um, you're not locked in to the committees you noted on the survey. Um, so you know, don't feel like, oh, I picked these two committees and that's the only committees that I have to be locked into them. That's not the case. Um, you have the ability to let us know if you changed your mind about the committees you've raised your hand for. Uh, we really encourage you to share your interest committees um, with us, um, honestly. And you know, like I said, no question is a dumb question. Feel free to please reach out to us uh, with any questions that you may have. So something else I wanted to highlight, um, give a little plug for, is our upcoming annual meeting in October. This place will take place in Washington, D.C., um, October 15th through the 16th. Um, this will be my first annual meeting, being that I just started at the Academy in May. So I hopefully I'll see some of you all there. Um, so what I've been told is a great place to come, meet your fellow actuaries, um, discuss critical issues. Uh, we have various breakout plenary sessions that will take place. A uh, great lineup of speakers, which I've seen on the website, um, including journalists, government officials, subject matter experts, uh, and lots like Lauren talked about, networking opportunities. Uh, it's a great time to network and meet some of your fellow colleagues across the field. So, resources. So you'll see a list of resources here. Uh, some of them I mentioned already. Um, the survey will open up tomorrow. Um, the page uh, will go live um, as well for information today. Um, once again, you know, if you want to screenshot this, but also I know there's a, you can download the PDF of this file uh, that's available. Uh, but all these different pages are really helpful um, in answering any questions that you may have. And part of the reason why I'm here is because part of my job is to help you all. Um, reach out to me as well at volunteer at actuary.org. So now I hope I've left plenty of time for any questions that you all may have. Um, any questions that you have, please enter your questions in the ask question box on the bottom of your screen. And that way we can better provide you with answers to things that you may have been, you know, itching to ask. Um, but before we go into that, I definitely want to thank Lauren and thank Bill uh, for jumping in today and you know, providing their much more detailed and in-depth knowledge than my three or four months here at the Academy. Uh, so I, I really appreciate them doing that. So if you have questions, please feel free uh, to ask them. I think I see a few here. 
Okay, I see one from MB Smith. Maybe I already asked an answer, but how can a volunteer? How can I volunteer as a retired person who no longer who no longer records CPD? So I can I can take that one. Can you I'm getting a little feedback? Hopefully everyone can hear me. Okay, I can take that one. Um, yeah. So so generally speaking, volunteers need to you know sign that they're that they're keeping up with their uh, continuing education. I think that's what what the question relates to, um, and so that can be done in a number of different ways, uh, but. But then, like I said, um, you know, oftentimes volunteering efforts can also um, also applies to to continuing it as well. So once once you're volunteering, then you know, depending on the situation, you can use the hours that you spend volunteering to count towards your continuing it. And Bill, I think I have one for you. Um, potential volunteer ask, please clarify what the presidential committees are. Oh, sure. Um, there are a number of committees uh, in our structure. Uh, those, like I mentioned earlier, that are within the councils and then those that are within the board. Um, and so there are practice council committees, there are presidential committees, which include committees like the nominating committee for the board, um, the committee on membership, uh, the performance committee, the research committee, which is one of those. Uh, and um, our pre presidential advisory committee, which really just is a resource for the current president as they guide the board uh, in fulfillment of the mission and the uh, strategic plan. So those are just some examples of committees that where the president is more heavily involved. Uh, there are committees of the board. There are obviously uh, other kind of presidential president elect committees like the strategic planning committee. So there are a number of different committees within the structure. But when we talk about presidential committee, uh, that information is listed there. And you can find this on the website as well. Um, they're all listed on the About Us page, where if you click on volunteer committees, you can see all the committees listed and includes members of those committees. It includes the chairs of those committees, as well as the staff liaisons. So there's a lot of information on that About Us page, um, which you can get to through the top navigation bar within the website. And Bill, I have another one for you. Do I need to be a subject matter expert or senior professional to volunteer? Definitely not. As you heard from Lauren, you know, I think what you need is a passion to give back to the profession and an eagerness and curiosity to learn more. Uh, when you have that knowledge, it's great. You can share that with your committee. But I think the real benefit is that you have a number of subject matter experts on those committees and you also have folks that are just interested to learn more. And that combination, I think, really is the secret sauce to what makes the Academy unique and, and how we work on various work products, practice notes, issue briefs, comment letters to various you know, governmental entities. But really, you don't need to be an expert. Um, and I think what you need is a willingness to dig in and contribute um, and a curiosity to learn more. And we have another question that says, does the AAA still have an international presence or any international entities or committees? Yeah, I mean, and, and Lauren, you can contribute to this too, for sure. Um, yes, a, a number of our committees uh, do cross, you know, all levels, whether it be state, federal, or global. You know, I think about committees like climate change. Uh, there's a lot of relevancy in what the climate change committee looks at, both within the domestic space as well as international, working with entities like the ISSB, which is the International Sustainability Standards Board, uh, and, other, and other committees uh, that are on a global level with more supranational entities, uh, as well as working with other organizations like our actuarial peer organizations on some of those global initiatives. Uh, in addition to that, you also have our data science and analytics committee that works on some of those more global topics, our financial reporting committee that worked a lot, quite a bit on IFRS 17. So there's a lot of committees that do touch global topics, particularly in our risk management um, and financial reporting council. Uh, so there's definitely opportunities if, if international is your, your interest, uh, as well as others that might be focused more primarily on the federal level or even the state level as well. Thank you, Bill. And we have a few more questions. What are some of the typical ways in which employers, particularly insurers, support academy volunteers? Yeah, so um, 
I can take this one. So, I mean, I think that uh, it, it spans, obviously, the time that the volunteers spend on committee work um, sometimes happens, you know, during the work day. So, you know, depending on the employer, you know, so, some, um, you know, arrangements can be made to, to allow for um, a little bit more flexibility in um, being able to attend committee meetings that might happen during the business work day. Also, if there if there is a need for travel, you know, the employer can also um, subsidize those costs um, related to the uh, the need for that travel. I will say, though, as far as travel goes, you know, there's don't don't let that hold you back. If you if you can't get um, employer um, buy in to to pay those costs, because there's a lot of different volunteer opportunities that can be done virtually. And we had another question. Uh, could you give more details on what the COI is and why it's required? Um, the conflict of interest is required of all volunteers. Uh, the main point of that is so uh, the fundamental purpose of the Academy, of course, requires us to maintain a high level of professional objectivity and independence from any specific interests of the employers or its members. So that's why we have volunteers sign the COI um, so they agree um, to uh, keep that high level of professional objectivity and independence when they're serving on the committees. Hopefully that provided you more detail. Yeah, and I would add to that, Tony. Um, I think it's important also to know the Academy really is a professional body. It's not a trade organization or a lobbying group. You know, and when we look at the work that our various committees and councils do, you tend to hear terms like independent, objective, balanced, and, and really what that is all about is the fact that we come into a certain scenario and it might be a federal agency asking us to look into a certain topic or an issue, or it might be something that we're looking at or monitoring. And we really try to provide a number of different perspectives on various issues and the pros and cons for each of those options. We like to say that we don't tell people the answer, but rather we provide them the information to make better decisions. And that's really why that conflict of interest is important because you're not there as a representative, say, of your employer or a certain perspective. You're there as a professional, an actuary who has a perspective to share. And sometimes what your employer thinks is, is, is important to that committee to know so they understand how industry might look at something versus maybe a regulator or maybe a consumer advocate group. So that whole perspective is very important. And that conflict of interest statement really just helps you understand and your employer that you're coming to this as a as an individual professional, um, and that you're it's it, we're, our approach to what we do as a committee or as a council or as a, a task force or a subcommittee is to make sure that what we put out there is balanced and, and provides information and resources to those decision makers. Thank you, Bill. I'm not sure who can take this one, but we will we will give it a shot. Uh, does the academy? ever proactively do research in an attempt to form a broad collective on pressing society societal issues. For example, would the Academy ever put forward key problems and detailed alternatives to U.S. healthcare issues? Yeah, the, the Academy has a, uh, a whole um, focus on research right now, and there is staff dedicated to um, various different uh, research topics related to um, climate change. I think there's one on solvency, all, all sorts of different um, perspectives. Bill might be able to jump in on exactly what's going right now, but but the short answer is absolutely. Um, the Academy gets involved in, in researching those, um, either in that research department um, with the staff and also within different committees. Um, and that, that work is, is done, you know, as, as needs arise. Yeah, I mean, in each year, with regard to the research agenda, committees and councils look at what priority topics they might be exploring and really work with the research committee on what those topics might be that we want to do deeper research in. You know, the ones that Lauren had mentioned is also a big initiative around cyber risk right now as well. So there's there's always a sort of rotating agenda depending on what we're seeing in the in the business environment as well as what we're hearing from various stakeholders as to where they need support. Another question we have, as a retired person, assume I had no CPD other than what I might get as a volunteer, how can I effectively volunteer? 
Yeah, I think that one yeah, that Lauren mentioned that Lauren mentioned earlier, I think it's really just I think like Lauren mentioned earlier. Uh, maybe the audio. I'm getting a little kickback, sorry. But while Bill's trying to work out this audio, let me see if there's another question that we can take. And I can try my audio too. Um, yeah, I'm not getting any feedback. So I am getting a little feedback, but but I'll try to answer the question. Um, so, so you know, obviously the the. I would I would point the person to the U.S. qualification standards related to you know anything on on continuing ed. Um, there's a 30 hour you know requirement and um, and it really is based on you know a question of for the actuary to decide you know can what you're doing enhance your ability to practice in your desired field. So. Um, and, and and that would would apply also to retired actuaries that are continuing to stay engaged as an actuary, I, I believe. So, so I think a lot of the hours that you would need would be filled through the through the volunteering efforts, and um, and then of course you know you need to just adhere to all the other um, qualification uh, standards that are in that document as well. Another volunteer had that same question, so hopefully that checks off the. You know, both of you all's questions that individuals who had that question. Um, so does anybody else have any questions before we wrap up here? Tony, could I clarify yes, one so? thing? Sure, Bill. Hopefully my audio is back. Um, just for the purposes of the call for volunteer survey, the presidential committee's question that one listener um, put into the chat, the ones that will be listed are the membership committee and the research committee. So. I just wanted to clarify that in case you, you are looking for those committees. Thank you, Bill. So once again, I want to thank Bill. I want to thank Lauren for their time today. Uh, on behalf of the presenters, uh, thank you all for participating uh, in today's webinar. Uh, for additional information, uh, I just want to remind you all, uh, if you ever want to reach out to myself or the team and membership, you can email volunteer at actuary.org um, to, register, to register for upcoming academy webinars and educational programs. You can always visit the events section, the events calendar on our website. It's pretty prominent at actuary.org. And this and all academy webinars will be available for viewing on demand on your academy member profile. So once again, I just want to thank you all so much for joining us today. Uh, look forward to seeing some of you all in October and have a great day.